ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, uh, welcome here at the premises of the Czech Academy of Sciences. And we are really happy that you all, you, all of you found your way here and for coming. Thank you. But first of all, please let me to extend, extend my sincere apologies for the absence of our president, Professor Eva Zajimalová, who unfortunately has some duties abroad, so she shouldn't come and I'm her replacement. So on her behalf, it's my great pleasure to welcome you here at this opening ceremony of the Diaspora Science Excellence Centers here in the Czech Republic. And we are particularly honored to, ho to host the representatives from the Max Planck Society and also from the German Federal Ministry of Education and Research. And also, we are very happy to welcome our colleagues, our representatives from the Czech Ministry of Education, Youth and Sports, and the colleagues from the Czech academic community. As we all know, well, following Poland, the Czech Republic has become the second country to launch the Dioscury Centres. And uh, three of them has been are being opening right now. Two of them go to the Czech Academy of Sciences and one to the Masaryk University in Brno, reflecting our position at the Czech scientific environment. And specifically, it will be two physicists and one developmental biology who have been selected and appointed as the leaders of these two new centers. And we are very much looking forward to the presentation of all three of them. Helena Reichlova, Barbara Špačková from our Institute of Physics, and also Petr Fabian from the Masaryk University. I really believe that their expertise and dedication will contribute to enhance the scientific, uh, scientific excellence of these centers, but not only in Prague and Brno, but also as elsewhere in the country among their collaborators. I wish also to acknowledge the goal of this initiative, that it's not only to foster and bolt the scientific excellence, but also to foster deeper collaboration between Czech Republic and Germany. And as such, we know that our partnership not only brings advantages, but also brings some commitments. And we are very much aware that on the Czech side, it means that uh, we have to support the diaspora centers with the state-of-the-art infrastructure and also to ensure that they will establish groups that will have all possible conditions to carry the cutting-edge cutting research and also to achieve competitive results. In this sense, I would like to stress that the Czech Academy of Sciences also supports scientific and research excellence and particularly among the young researchers by various programs. And among them, our key instruments for promoting excellence are Premium Academia, the Academic Premium, Lumina Querontur, the Prospective Human Resources Support Program for the Postdoctoral Fellows, Otto Wichterle Award, and our newly launching program, the Academy for the Future. Ladies and gentlemen, we know that Dioscuri as a symbol of strong brotherly bonds in Greek mythology I wish our relations in the future to be as strong and lasting as the bond between these two brothers. And at the very end, please let me to present small gifts from the Czech Academy of Sciences to all three new leaders of these diaspora centers as a reminder of the ceremony and also to remember where we spend it. So, and by the way, I thank Bara for this idea. So thank you for your attention and enjoy today. And I'm very much looking forward to all this lovely event. Thank you. And now please let me switch a role and to welcome further speakers of the welcoming speeches. And the first of all is my great pleasure to welcome on the stage Professor Radka Veldová from the Ministry of uh, Education, Youth and Sports of the Czech Republic. Thank you very much. Okay. 
thank you very much, David. It was very pleasure to welcome me this way. So ladies and gentlemen, good morning and welcome here. I am delighted to warmly welcome you to Prague for the opening ceremony of the first three Dioscuri centers in the Czech Republic. Today we celebrate something remarkable, the start of three exceptional journeys led by outstanding young scientists, Helena, Barbara, and Peter. Please accept my sincere wishes for your success. May your discovery centers become sources of groundbreaking discoveries and serve as inspiration for scientific communities worldwide. During your journeys, please remember the importance of working together and supporting each other. And most importantly, I hope you will keep finding joy in your work and dedication to research. I would like to take a moment to thank for our German partners, to the Max Planck Society for the decision to expand the Dioscuri program into the Czech Republic. Your commitment to establishing international competitive Dioscuri centers in Central and Eastern Europe with the support of partners from Germany is deeply appreciated. And to the Federal Ministry of Education and Research for the generous contribution covering half of the funding. Your support is invaluable in assuring the success and sustainability of the Dioscuri centers in our country. Our collaboration represents our joint commitment to advancing research and fostering excellence. And today we witness the realization of this vision. Also, my heartfelt thanks belong to the Czech Academy of Sciences for hosting us today and all who have contributed to making this day possible. In closing, I again extend my warmest welcome to each of you. So let's celebrate today and look forward to all the amazing discoveries that will come from the new Dioscuri centers. Good luck and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Vildová. And now it's my great pleasure to welcome our special guest, Professor Patrick Rammer, the head of the president of the Max Planck Society. Thank you very much. The floor is yours. Well, today is very, very special. But yesterday was very special to me too. Can you imagine when you work as a molecular geneticist for 30 years and then you finally get to the place where it all began? I went to the monastery where Gregor Mendel in Brno conducted over 10,000 hybridization experiments to find out about the basic laws of inheritance. It was very moving. A lot of young people joined the lecture. Um, I had many good discussions. And I was thinking, you know, when they were showing me the room where he did his work, when they were showing me the garden where he planted the plants, when they were showing me also the large basilica where he was doing his prayers, I was thinking, you know, there's many things that are special about the life of Gregor Mendel. But three things clearly to me stand out, and that is because I think they provide very important lessons for today when we open the Dioscuri centers, uh, because they teach us about science in general. So let me briefly mention them. This is my choice of the three important ones. First, he was driven by curiosity. 
He was observing nature and he realized there's an enigma, there's inheritance. What is the mechanism? How does it work? Second point, in order to find out, he had to cross borders. Can you imagine somebody who's combining botany with statistics? This was probably the reason why, you know, his manuscript that he um, wrote in 1865 um, was not understood at the time because he brought together botany and statistics. It was just too much for people. He actually sent it to Charles Darwin and several others. And Charles Darwin didn't even open the mail. And it took until 1900, so two generations for the time, right? 35 years, until it was rediscovered. And three um, scientists at the time uh, realized that he is really the founder of genetics. And that is the third lesson for me, and that is, sorry to say, science also goes along sometimes with frustration. And you have to be persistent, and why? Because the truth will always prevail. And those are three, you know, big lessons, I think, from Gregor Mendel's heritage. Ladies and gentlemen, I also have a formal speech, <laughs> but this was so close to my heart that I wanted to tell you, but um, dear Professor Runes, thanks for greeting us. Vice Minister Wildova, thanks for your kind words. It's a pleasure to be here. Dear Mrs. Armani from the Ministry in Germany, dear colleagues, dear friends, uh, dear guests. What was equally important yesterday in Brno was of course that I saw the future of science. I saw the brilliant facilities the clean rooms, nanotechnology, waiver production. I saw the cryo-EM, the facilities for the life sciences. And more importantly, I talked to many highly motivated scientists. Because all about the people and their ideas, it's about which experiment will you actually conduct on this high-end machine that you find in your facility. Today, I'm happy to be here in the Czech Academy. It's another hub, another international hub for science here in Prague. Thanks for hosting us here. We should never forget what the key to success is when we look at the world. It's really maintaining our strong cooperation within Europe. Actually, the Max Planck Society has most shared publications with that come from collaborative, collaborative research with scientists within Europe. And when I say Europe, I mean, of course, the European Union, but also Switzerland, the United Kingdom, and also Israel. This is all part of a large European research area. And for us, it's the most important research area. That's the area where we contribute and where we collaborate. And only together are we going to be competitive and are we going to play a role in a multilateral world with the rise of Asian countries and so forth, all the geopolitical conflicts. So when we look at Europe, just two examples, let's go to Poland. Where are the Dioscuri leaders from Poland? Because I know a very warm welcome. I must say I'm really impressed that you're here. To me, this, this tells me one thing. It's that we begin to build a European community. We go beyond the national communities. You know, top scientists have always been moving around, but this has to be, you know, the standard that it's a European research area. Thanks for coming today, for showing your commitment, your solidarity, all the best also to your work. You know, what happened in Poland half a year ago in the election in October 2023, is a very interesting and important development. We know all the issues that we face now, but you know, with all the negative news that we get, you know, the right-wing extremists and all this, we also see that there's a clear commitment to democracy, to the freedom rights in Europe, and that is, we have the majority and we will prevail. Now, coming to the Czech Republic, right? And that's really in the focus today, I think, you're celebrating 20 years of membership. It was mentioned 
in the European Union. I think this has changed the way we live. I mean, I've just, when, we, when I had the TV interview, they asked me uh, what I think, what the developments are like. And together with my wife, I was here just after the wall came down, a long time back to Prague. And if you look what happened over those decades, it's just incredible. It's an entirely new generation. So many things have happened. And I think it's because we are here at the heart of Europe, right? We're at the center of Europe and we have great partners all around. So just look at the group leaders of the new, the three new Dioscury centers, Helena Reichlova, Barbara Spachkova, and Peter Fabian, whom I actually met yesterday already, the two of you I, I will get to know now. I'm very much looking forward to hear about your work. Um, they all moved within Europe, right? They went to France, Germany, Sweden. This is now possible. We have the EU, it fosters mobility, it also helps us to change perspective. And that is what you need if you want to be truly outstanding in science. You have to question your hypothesis and you have to change perspective. And that often means you have to change the environment to succeed. The EU actually also fosters collaboration. Just to give you a number, when you count the publications of the Max Planck Institutes that are done together with scientific partners here in the Czech Republic, only last year, we have um, 66 scientific collaborations ongoing. So it tells us there's a lot of ties already and a lot of interactions between scientists, between Germany, Max Planck Society and the Czech Republic. Actually about half of those are in the natural sciences, but not only, we have law, we have the social sciences, humanities, you name it. And from now on the Dioscury centers provide additional hubs to enlarge our European network of excellence. They help us to attract young scientists from around the world. So it's beneficial for everyone. Let me take this opportunity to thank our partners here, especially those without whom the Dioscury program could not have been realized. Of course, our colleagues from the Ministry for Education, Youth and Sports, our supporters from the Dioscury Roundtable and the German Embassy here in Prague. And a particular thanks goes to Joachim Sauer, the chair of the Dioscury Committee, and actually all members of the committee, I've seen already some of them, who shaped the program from the beginning in 2018. I think it was their commitment to that we got to the point where we are now. And of course, I would like to thank also the German Ministry for Education and Research for their contribution, the financial contribution, but of course, more importantly, the commitment that we see how important the Dioscury program is. Dear Helena, Barbara and Peter, today you are at the center. You are at the center of our attention. Congratulations on the first three Dioscury centers in the Czech Republic. Thank you for your ideas, for your efforts to advocate European science and for taking on the responsibility also to train the next generation because now you did it and you are a PI and now this comes with your responsibilities. But I can tell you from my experience, it's a pleasure to serve the next generation. We are all very much looking forward to hear about your science in the areas of single molecule optics, quantum materials and human hereditary diseases. Be assured that we wish you all the best for your work and of course all the success for your future career here in Europe. We will celebrate. There's a little bit of work now to do because we're all very excited to hear about your science, but then also we will have time for exchange. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming. Thanks for joining. And let's applaud our three new Dioscury uh, group leaders. Welcome. Thank you, Professor Kramer, for your nice words. And now I was about to welcome our next speaker, who is Professor Joachim Zauer, Chair of the Dioscury Committee. Unfortunately, Professor Zauer was unable to come, but we were lucky enough to get a video message from him. So thank you, Professor Zauer, and the floor is yours. This is a happy day for science, not only for Czech Republic, but also for Germany and Europe 
as a whole. We get all stronger when each of us, each of our partners gets stronger. As a chair of the center committee, I can assure you that we, the members of the committee, have been very much committed to this extension of the DOSCO program. And I am grateful to Professor Kramer that he has already mentioned it. And we were looking forward to this special moment very much. We are glad to see three outstanding young colleagues becoming leaders of DOSCO centers with impressive research programs. And it is worth mentioning that two of them are women. But this is also a special moment for me personally. I was more than happy to accept when President Stratmann invited me to become chair of the committee and help to establish centers in Poland and now in Czech Republic. There are two reasons for this. After the wall came down, I profited from a special program of the Max Planck Society, very similar to the Dioscuri program, funding of research groups in East German universities. The other reason is that during communist times, when I was confined behind the wall, my colleagues in Poland and Czechoslovakia provided strong moral and scientific support. I felt being part of a community with shared human and scientific values. It is hard to imagine how I could have survived without the encouragement of people like Rudolf Saratnik, the former president of the Czech Academy. He would be extremely pleased if we could witness what happens today. I regret that I cannot be with you today, but I will follow the presentations on YouTube. Thank you very much. And uh, our last speaker in this session, and it's my great pleasure to welcome Mrs. Gabriele Hermane from the German Federal Ministry of Education and Research. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, dear Professor Hornes, dear Ms. Uh, Director General uh, Wildova. Uh, thank you for your warm welcome, dear Professor Kramer, dear Professor Döller, dear Professor Sauer, ladies and gentlemen, dear professors, dear uh, science community of Czech and Poland, which I suppose are here today too. With great pleasure, we, the Federal Ministry of Education and Research, shortly BNBF, as you probably all know, followed the invitation to participate in this opening event of the three Dioscuri centers in the Czech Republic. The Dioscuri program of the Max Planck Society aims at fostering excellent young researchers in different fields of cutting edge basic science. With the implementation of this program, BMBF and the Czech Ministry of Education, Youth and Sports aim to close existing innovation and research gaps in Europe and overcome borders. And I will shortly explain why we think this. First, it is a step to enable Max Planck-like centers in countries of Central Eastern Europe. Our neighbor, Poland, was a natural starting point to begin with. The Czech Republic is an equally natural partner country to parallel this step, its capital Prague lying a lot nearer to Berlin than Warsaw and its border further west. Second, the Dioscuri program has crossed a border of funding instrumentation. It is not a short-term funding of bilateral projects, but aim at a longer-term support of an excellent research manager in building up a research facility and recruiting a group of fellow talented young researchers and developing a team of specific experts. Third, these research centers follow the founding idea of the Max Planck Society in shifting the borders and barriers of knowledge across the limits of up-to-date science. 
Ladies and gentlemen, the opening of three Czech discovery centers not only crosses real borders between West and East Europe, it bridges a segregation in science and innovation. These centers signify a major step forward in the implementation of the European research area. Both BMBF and Max Planck Society are deeply convinced that the three centers and their managers, Dr. Reichlova, Dr. Fabian, and Dr. Spachkova, will successfully tackle the borders of their subjects of magnetics, biology, and optics, and build up beacons of German-Czech collaboration. Research and innovative results from these centers will connect basic science and market innovation and bridge the innovation gap, not only in the Czech Republic and in Germany, but for Europe as a whole. So in the longer term, the Dioscuri centers are expected to have a leverage, of, a leverage effect for deeper European cooperation. So on behalf of BMBF, my thank goes to the Max Planck uh, Society that invented and implements this program to the Czech Ministry of Education, Youth and Sports for co-financing and to the Czech Academy of Sciences and to the Masuric University for hosting these centers of scientific excellence. A further thank is directed to all the talented and engaged researchers who handed in their highly qualitative applications to the call of 2022. And last but not least, my gratitude and congratulations to the three research managers who will now start their long-term endeavor to support and enrich the European research area. Thank you very much for your attention. So thank you. I would like to thank all the five first speakers for the welcoming speeches and, and remarks. And now we will, we will move on to the second block where we will hear the presentations of the new diaspora centers in the Czech Republic. And for that, I would like to pass the microphone to the Professor Christian Duller, Vice President of the Max Planck Society and also the member of the diaspora committee. So thank you for coming and thank you for sharing this session. Thank you very much. Uh, I take this microphone. When I when I came in last night to Prague, I realized that there are huge events in the in the city, uh, big sports events, big rock concerts, with uh, many many more guests than here, huge audiences. I personally feel this is the most important event today in Prague because we are celebrating science, and it's my great pleasure uh, to introduce the uh, three Dioscuri Center leaders. And I had the honor to be part of this committee last year when we interviewed the candidates. And I can tell you, I mean, I shouldn't shouldn't reveal confidential information from committees, but the three were really sticking out. They were tremendous in their, in their science, they outlined in their performance in the interviews. Um, as Joachim Sauer, who unfortunately can't be here with us today, uh, already outlined, the Dioscuri committee was very excited that we could extend the program to Czechia in uh, 2022. The first call of the centers received really an enormous interest uh, in the country, uh, reflected in a really high number of competitive applications. Uh, thanks to the input from uh, expert here, experts here in the country, we actually slightly adjusted the program parameters. So first of all, we included also international researchers already working in the country. Uh, and secondly, we also allowed applications from uh, native Czech researchers who had only recently returned back uh, uh, to the country. And you will see this already uh, paid off this decision because two of the researchers we are celebrating today returned uh, to their Czech host institutions only a few months uh, before submitting their application. With the Dioscuri funding, we as the program, the Dioscuri program and the Max Planck Society, aim to support uh, them in setting up an internationally really competitive uh, research group conducting uh, innovative research and uh, developing it into a center of excellence over many years, ideally decades. So it's really thought of a 
pocket of excellence, offer seed funding, uh, to give them stability, uh, uh, to uh, come up with new great ideas for fundamental research. Uh, let me start by introducing the first group leader. Uh, who has already actually established uh, these scientists are fast, they want to work. Uh, the first center uh, in uh, spin, calyotronics, and magnonics. I must admit, I haven't really before was sitting in the committee uh, knew about what that exactly is. At the Institute of Physics of the Czech Academy of Sciences in October 2023, uh, Dr. Helena Reichlova. Uh, Helena was born in the Czech Republic, uh, where she also completed her PhD at the Faculty of Mathematics and Physics at Charles University in 2016. Uh, and after that, she had, or after a research stay at Ohio State University in the US. In 2018, she actually went to the Technical University in Dresden as a postdoc, where they then in the end became Elna Traffic's professor in uh, 2022. This is a special tenure track program of the university uh, in Dresden. Helena has already received uh, a number of prestigious fellowships and prizes. For instance, the Otto Richterle Young Scientist Award from the Czech Academy of Sciences. Her research at the center will be in cooperation with Professor Sebastian Gronenwein from the University of Constance, a world-renowned uh, expert in the field of uh, conventional spin, calutronics, and magnonics, and is actually here with us today. Uh, so I would like to ask Helena as the first speaker to present her center to us. Thank you. So thank you, Professor Dora, for the introduction. Thank you uh, for, for the nice words. And uh, uh, as I said, uh, um, yes, I, am, I would like to start with saying that I am really grateful for the program uh, uh, which, was, which was launched for the Diospori program. I would like to thank uh, those who initiated the program, who, who, who kind of started the, the negotiations about the Diospori program in Czech Republic, and also the, those who, who executed all these formal requirements uh, to, to fit it to the both Czech and uh, German uh, frame. So I, I really appreciate it. And I'm very honored to be one of the one of the leaders of this uh, Dioscore program. So, um, as it was already said, I am um, having the, my support from from Germany. I am very very grateful that Professor Genenwein uh, agreed to be my uh, a partner of my Dioscore Center, and I'm also very grateful that the Institute of Physics uh, uh, hosts my Dioscore Center. I feel very strong support from 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 the Institute of Physics of the Czech Academy of Sciences, and I, I am very much appreciating that. So let me start by the, by the motivation, actually, what is the motivation for, for our research program? Motivation, uh, I will outline here in the slide, is that we are all depending in many aspects of our life on the information technologies. All these uh, things are bringing us amazing <coughs> opportunities and uh, uh, it's also related to the uh, amount of data which are being generated by, by various means, which is exponentially increasing uh, in, in, the, in the time. The amount of data which are being generated and, and, and also stored uh, uh, are, of course, also related to the a uh, little bit more um, burning question, and this is the energy consumption of the information technologies. The energy consumption of the information technologies is also exponentially increasing, and some of the predictions are uh, that the uh, overall uh, electricity demand of information technologies will reach around 20% in the uh, couple of years. This naturally calls for some fundamental solutions uh, which should come from the fundamental research. Let's look how the uh, situation in, in uh, present day computing uh, looks and what are the challenges. So uh, traditionally the way how to uh, make our uh, uh, computers more efficient was to reduce the, the, the size of the transistors. Uh, this can be illustrated on this uh, uh, cartoon or on this uh, picture that since its discovery in, in Bell Labs in uh, 70 years ago, uh, we reached the, the, the size of uh, individual transistors to be around nanometers. And uh, this is, the, this is the, uh, also the physical limit where we simply cannot go that way. We cannot make the transistor smaller and smaller. And this was also recognized uh, by the community and uh, uh, the, the roadmap, which was typically uh, predicting how, how uh, smaller the transistors will be to increase the efficiency was, is not issued anymore. 
Second uh, point, which is discussed in parallel, um, is that our traditional computer architecture, which is uh, 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 relying on, on a processor, uh, which is separated from the memory, um, is maybe not the most uh, uh, suitable uh, computer architecture anymore. Uh, this, this relies on this binary input and output of the data. And for many reasons, there would be uh, advantages to, to move to uh, uh, something which I call here processing in memory, something which would be inspired by how our, our brain works, where we would rely more on some uh, spikes as an output and input. So uh, these two examples already show that uh, the, the solutions which we have to come up uh, must go beyond the traditional materials, beyond the semiconductors, and also beyond this traditional uh, computer architecture, these concepts which we are using right now. So before I introduce and explain actually what this uh, spin color electronic and magnetic uh, is, uh, let, me, let me make a small detour and say that there was already a, a concept which uh, improved to help the, uh, with, the, with the efficiency of the, of the computing. This is Spintronics, where also I did my PhD in this, in this research field. And uh, in Spintronics, uh, uh, we, we employ the, the uh, quantum property of the electron, the spin, to increase the, the, the efficiency of uh, our uh, computers. And the most important effect it has on the memory uh, element, whereby the non-volatility of the magnets, which can remember the information without uh, consuming the, the energy, we can make the uh, electronics uh, more efficient and less energy demanding. Here, this spindronic research, I think, is a nice example that a fundamental uh, discovery made in uh, the year when I was born <laughs> made it to the applications, uh, which are presently uh, present in, in many, many of our uh, devices. Uh, here, just one example of the hard drive. But this was like an efficient way how to, how to improve the efficiency. The key uh, property, which uh, uh, is important to, to, to mention in this context, is that uh, the uh, spintronic device relies on uh, electric current, which uh, carries some uh, these, these balls, let's think about them like electrons, which carry some spin, uh, spin polarization, which can uh, enable some writing of a memory bit, let's, let's say from the zero to, 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 the, to the one number in the most simplistic way. This is great achievement, as I said, that we reduce the energy. However, in this spintronic devices, we also have um, uh, many more challenges which we, uh, which we can discuss in the context of energy reduction. The first is obviously the moving electrons. Moving electrons means uh, dissipation of energy, means uh, waste heat. Also, the present spintronic devices are operating at the not optimal gigahertz frequencies. And also, this binary type of, of logic is not the optimal uh, for the brains-inspired devices, as I was mentioning on the, on the introduction slide. So let me introduce two more concepts, which are discussed in, let's say, last uh, 10 years, which aim to overcome some of these uh, uh, obstacles. The first one is the magnonics. Magnonics, the key uh, idea of magnonics, is to uh, avoid the moving electrons, to make electrons which are uh, not traveling through a material. However, the information is transferred in a form of a wave of spins, uh, so-called magnons. And this naturally uh, reduces the, the joule heating because we do not have the electrons moving through a material, which leads to the, the uh, decrease of the energy needs. These, these magnons can be used both for information processing or, or memory elements, as illustrated here. And uh, they can be very useful uh, in the uh, quest for uh, efficient, uh, efficient electronics. The second research field, which is again uh, uh, discussed uh, in the last uh, 10 years, let's say, is the spin electronics. This combines two uh, uh, properties. This is the spin and the heat gradient. And it aims to harvest and directly functionalize the uh, heat, the, the thermal gradient. Again, for example, in, in the very, very uh, simplistic way, uh, just having a thermal gradient, which would allow to, to uh, make the information writing or reading instead of the electrical current, instead of the moving, moving electrons. So these two research uh, fields of the spin electronics and magnetics are here with us, uh, as I said, for, for a couple of years. 
and probably inspired by the spintronics, they are uh, traditionally studied or widely studied in the materials which are called ferromagnets, which are having, let's say, these spins oriented in this uh, uh, parallel way, all of them pointing in the uh, same direction. And these are also the materials which we know under the term of magnet, uh, which are having some, uh, some stray magnetic field. These materials, however, are uh, well, uh, now in the magnonics, we, let's say, address the moving electrons. We have some ways how to efficiently harvest the, the waste heat. Uh, the ferromagnets give us the strong spin signals. However, the ferromagnets in the same time are not optimal for the, the gigahertz frequencies, which we, which we would like to, uh, uh, are not optimal for the fast frequencies and also not for the, the brain-inspired functionality. And most importantly, uh, uh, the, there is a relatively narrow material choice, which does not allow the, the most efficient magnonic and spintronic functionality. That's why um, in last, um, again, 15 years, there is a, a strong research interest in exploring uh, antiferromagnets for spintronics. And in our case, we want to also explore materials uh, which are called antiferromagnets for magnonics and spinkalotronics. Here, these materials, they uh, have, uh, again, a magnetic ordering. However, the individual uh, magnetic, uh, these individual spins are pointing in the antiparallel direction. Therefore, there is no net magnetic moment on the outside. And these address these issues of, uh, let's say, the gigahertz frequencies. They operate at higher frequencies, and they were also shown to be uh, optimal for the brain-inspired functionality. However, in these uh, antiferromagnets, they are very uh, useful for, for our uh, magnetic and spintronic research. However, this weak uh, spintronic signal was something which uh, uh, was uh, representing a, a significant hurdle. And this changed in the um, uh, last uh, five years when the uh, theory uh, discovery identified yet another uh, fundamental class of magnetic materials, which are now called ultramagnetic materials. And in these materials, we combine the advantages of the ferromagnetic and antiferromagnetic materials. And they uh, represent, uh, therefore, an ideal uh, choice from all these points, which I mentioned, for magnonic and spin research. As I mentioned, the important aspect is that there is also wide material choice uh, when we stay in the realm of antiferromagnets and ultramagnets, which also makes them the ideal candidate to optimize the magnonic and spin responses um, in our uh, devices. So as a summary, I presented that uh, we want to study uh, spin and magnonic. Uh, this for that, we are very happy to have support from, from uh, the German partner of the Dioscuris Center, Professor Genenwein, who is a world-recognized expert in these, uh, uh, these two areas. In the same time, we are hosted at the Institute of Physics in the Department of Spintronics, which is the world-leading uh, institution when it comes to the uh, antiferromagnetic and ultramagnetic um, spintronics. And our Dioscuris Center is uh, combining the, the advantages and the uh, coming up with uh, entirely new uh, uh, opportunities, building on these two strong partners which we have. We therefore open a new research direction of, of magnonics and spin in outer magnets and antiferromagnets, and we hope that this will help us to bring towards the more sustainable IT technology. Thank you for your attention. Thanks so much for the presentation. What was interesting for me as a neuroscientist that you also use some of the sort of working principles from the brain to inspire the, the work on your, on your physics. I found that interesting. So the next uh, uh, center leader we would like to introduce uh, is uh, Dr. Peter Fabian. Uh, he is the leader of the Dioscuri Center for Stem Cell Biology and Metabolic Diseases. Uh, Peter was born in Slovakia and completed his PhD at the Institute of Molecular Genetics at Charles University in 2016. Uh, he then went to the Department of Stem Cell Biology and Regenerative Medicine at the University at, uh, of Southern California in the US, where he stayed as a postdoc for five years and actually received several highly competitive research fellowships. One was the K99, so this is an NIH uh, special program uh, uh, pathway uh, to independent research award, uh, very competitive. 
in 22, uh, he then joined the Department of Experimental Biology at the Faculty of Sciences at Masaryk University in Brno, uh, where he will start uh, his Dioscuri Center uh, this July. Uh, he has also received an ERC starting grant, so an additional satellite he can uh, integrate into his center, and a Gacha Junior Star Grant. And uh, his cooperation partner from the German side is Professor Stefan schulte merker uh, He is head of the Institute for Cardiovascular Organogenesis and Regeneration at the University of Münster. Uh, the floor is here. We are very much looking forward to hear more about your research plans. Thank you very much for having me. So my name is Peter Fabian, and uh, my Dioscuri Center is called Stem Cell Biology and Metabolic Diseases. But today, I would like to tell you more about metabolic diseases, and specifically about one disease. But in my lab, and in our lab, we work on the human inborn diseases, showing here, uh, affecting uh, the human body um, more, more generally. And I, I pick one of them for today's talk. Uh, it is quite mysterious um, disease called algaptonuria, which is changing the normal urine of patients to the brown, uh, um, brown urine. So let me tell you a story. But let's rewind 120 years back to London, to the great Omart Street, which is also called the, uh, the hospital for sick kids. Now, frightened mother came, uh, it was Victorian era, frightened mother came to the hospital and say, oh, look, doctor, the, the nappy of my, my child is turning from yellow to brown. Something is strange. And little that she know that the, the doctor that was uh, there was not just physician, but also as a scientist. So he had a long database of, of, of patients with, uh, with this condition to specifically focus on the urine. So uh, he realized that uh, patients that are from uh, first cousin marriages got this condition more often. So he connected the dots, and uh, Professor Kramer mentioned that significant, uh, significant uh, scientists didn't read the, the paper from Gregor Mendel, but Sir Archibald did read uh, his research, and he understood that this is inherited so thanks to this condition, thanks to these gentlemen, we know more about that we are also affected by uh, inherited diseases. So I, in the next slide, I'm going to tell you more about this condition and I will, have, I will show some graphic content, so just to let you know. So uh, thanks to the improvement of science and, and genetics and, and medicine, we know that this is uh, inherited diseases, a disease uh, affecting one to quarter million of people. Uh, very rare. It influenced the body fluids, like urine, but also the sweat and, and tears, actually. And uh, this is not co just cosmetic problem, as you can see, it's affecting also the skin, sclera, and, and ear, but also it's affecting the, the collagen-rich fibrils, which we've got in our joints, and therefore those patients got early onset of, of uh, osteoarthritis, affecting, uh, I'm showing you uh, here in this, uh, uh, okay, now you can look. Um, so alcaptonuria, thanks to the, the biochemical approaches, uh, advances, we know a little bit more about what is causing this, this blackening of, of, of the body fluids and, and, and tissues. So it's in influenced by the diet, where we eat proteins, we've got amino acids, and those amino acids are, are, are got important body functions. And if something goes wrong in this pathway, there is, if there occurs a mutation, so this is causing a malfunctioning of this pathway, which is then intoxicating the body through the, the blackening of the skeleton. And then we wanted to know, uh, we, because one of the study, one of the approaches how to, how to help patients is to, get, to create a, an animal model that can recapitulate these, these diseases and then we can help them. So I'm, I'm working with the fish and you can say, but Peter, fish is totally different than we are. Yeah? Like they look totally different. I'll bring you a couple arguments that that's uh, partially true, but also we share 70% of genes. Uh, we've got all major organs similar to fish. Um, the fish got external development, so we can look what is happening during the, 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 uh, the, the developing of the embryo or the adult. <clears throat> and it's fantastic genetic model, which I will try to demonstrate in the next slide. 
And uh, we, we combining these, we can do the live imaging of these animals and then really observe what is happening. So we created a mutant uh, in zebrafish. In the top row, I'm showing you the healthy animal. And in the bottom one, I'm showing you the animal with the, the, the blackening of the, of the body fluids that it got uh, inside the, uh, its body. It's similar to the patient's. And now uh, we, we confirm that this is the same compound that is in, in a patient, suggesting that we can use this for studying this phenomena. Uh, we also spotted uh, that this animal, uh, this is the healthy fish, and this is the, the adult uh, mutant fish, it's turning black, similar to the patient's. And so this is the very first model recapitulating this phenomena in a mouse. This wasn't able to, they did, did not recapitulate this blackening. I'm showing you here in these others uh, the, um, bones of the, of the body. Not just the, uh, the, the bones, but also the cartilages that are so critical for our movement and, uh, um, and uh, avoiding these. Uh, we, we can study this to, to understand what is happening in the patient's body during the osteoarthritis, early onset of osteoarthritis. Because it's a live animal, we, we, I want to show you that the, uh, the top row we've got healthy animal, in the bottom row we've got the mutant animal. And I, I think this is obvious, how agile are the, the wild type or the healthy animals, and then how sluggish are the mutant animals. They are, cannot move properly. And we believe that their movement is affected by this, this compound, and they cannot move properly. So here, we, how we quantify it and how we can appreciate that that's a significant drop. So in the future, this is not data, this is my vision for, for, for what we will do with fish. So we, will, we want to use this mutant fish to treat with the different uh, pharmacological compounds and test the new compounds. And hopefully we'll see the clearance of the, of the, of the body fluids and then other, other, uh, other um, demonstra manifestation of this of these, of these, uh, condition. So I, I pick one example. I told you about alcaptonuria, but in a human uh, disorders similar to in this pathway, we've got other uh, diseases. Maybe you heard before phenylketonuria uh, or tyrosinemia. They are affecting the same, uh, same uh, domain. They are affecting the development, cognition, and quality of life of those patients. And everybody in this room uh, was uh, tested for if you've got this condition or no. Uh, when you've been uh, five years old, they did the, the uh, sorry, uh, five days old, they did the, the, the hill spot test to test if you've got high phenylalanine or no. So, and then today, the only, like a, um, uh, the treatment that they can use, it's mainly the diet to help to improve the diet so they don't develop these diseases. And we will try to find another condition, uh, another chemical compounds to help these patients. So, alcaptonuria, as I mentioned, is uh, one uh, of 6,000 inherited diseases. If we want to show how many people are affected, I it would be like, like this, and you cannot see it because it's a population of Vatican City. So this is how many people are affected by alcaptonuria. But out of 6,000 inherited diseases, we've got 220 million people affected. And if you want to demonstrate it on a world population, it would be like a population of Brazil, which is approximately 20, uh, 220 million of people. So this big population, I'm sorry, it's, it's affected by the, the inherited diseases. And more, not just them, but their families as well. So, and as my German partner who is not here, Stefan Schulte-Merkel will say, it's a, it's a uh, just number, it's, it's a very small probability to get it. Uh, it's a, um, a low chance, but it suddenly it's changing it's totally different when it's affecting your family and your friends. So with that, uh, let me thank you uh, for being here. Uh, this is a fantastic opportunity for me and my lab, who uh, is also here, uh, showing here. Um, I would like to thank my uh, grant uh, agencies. This is uh, our, our um, institute, and here uh, is my lab. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for the presentation. So our third center leader we would like to celebrate today is Barbara Spakova. She is the leader of the Dioscuri Center for Single Molecule Optics. Barbara was born in Czechia and completed her PhD at the Institute of Photonics and Electronics 
of the Czech Academy of Sciences in 2015. Babo then pursued a scientific career at Chalmers University of Technology in Sweden. In 2020, she co-founded NU Technologies, a Swedish spin-off company commercializing nanofluidic scattering microscopy, a unique single molecule imaging method that she developed during her postdoctoral stay. In 2022, she was awarded uh, a Marie uh, Curie Fellowship, postdoctoral fellowship, one of these prestigious uh, European Union fellowships, enabling her to return to Czechia and continue her research at the Institute of Physics at the Czech Academy of Sciences. Her center, which will open in July 24, will be supported by her cooperation partner from Germany, Professor Stefan Dietz from uh, Technical University Dresden, who is also with us today. Uh, he's an international expert uh, for bio nano tools and also a Max Planck fellow at one of our flagship institutes, the Max Planck Institute uh, of Molecular Cell Biology and Genetics in Dresden. Uh, the floor is here. We would like to hear more about your center. Thank you very much for a kind introduction. And I feel, of course, very honored. Uh, and I would like to thank you all to, to come today and to celebrate with me and uh, with uh, uh, the two other um, lead, leaders of the Dioscore Centers. Um, it is very easy to answer fundamental biological questions. Just look at the thing. So. That was Richard Feynman's suggestion how to address the, the key biological questions at the time. Uh, and by the thing, he of course uh, meant the nanoscopic building blocks of life, the, the biomolecules. And what he was actually saying that he was suggesting that the biologists should push physicists to create better microscopes because um, basically seeing better is understanding better. And since then, you know, since this like Feynman's call to action, of course, a lot of things happen. And right now, like we have the whole like, wide portfolio of uh, microscopic methods that allows us to see with single molecular resolution. That help us really to uncover the complexity of life at a molecular level. So uh, consider this like every human cell uh, contains about 40 millions of different biomolecules that are created out of 10 trillion of different um, atoms. Uh, and each of the molecule uh, actually uh, is part of, or, or of this like vital processes that, um, and all of these molecules are kind of involved in this, this very um, uh, dynamic dance that basically allows us to live. But, you know, this video that we are looking at, it's not like zoom in inside the cell. We are not looking at the thing. Um, this is basically like just like a representation or, or a simulated animation uh, that was built based on hypotheses that were created using different instruments. Like each of the experiment provided us uh, with an important um, with an important information. Um, in addition, like uh, these, um, these biomolecules, where uh, they need to be somehow modified. So we are not looking at, the, at, at their natural state. Um, and that could create uh, certain biases. So basically, that is basically a different representation of my very famous TV uh, show um, for kids uh, uh, on uh, biochemistry. So how difficult is actually to see a single molecule, biomolecule, why we cannot just zoom in and observe the life as it, as it is happening. So first of all, biomolecule is very tiny, it's very small. You're talking about nanometers, which is like one billionth of the meter, much bigger than the wavelength of the life. Sorry, the light. <laughs> Wavelength of the light, I don't think that it's defined yet. Uh, so when you shine a light on it, uh, only a very tiny portion of the light is scattered, which makes them virtually invisible. 
And at the top of that, the biomolecules are moving and they are moving quite fast. They are constantly pushed by water molecules, which is described as gravity in motion. So, so um, it's basically like um, shooting a movie of a black cat in a black box when the cat is constantly moving and many times you're not even sure that the cat is there, right? So what made it possible is forest and microscopy. It's like super uh, powerful method uh, that involves like chemical attachment of a fluorescent dye that basically serves as a beacon in darkness. Uh, but the method <clears throat> Uh, can lead to undesirable modification, which can lead to, to, to biases. Basically, uh, it's very difficult for the molecule to behave naturally when uh, like there's a big shining backpack sitting on, his, on its back. And also, we can see only predefined targets. Uh, so, some, uh, so the rest is basically invisible, which, and the rest might be... Might be uh, as well important. So electrons are much more convenient for imaging nanoscopic objects due to their much shorter uh, wavelength. Uh, we can observe, you know, the, the, it can provide us the even like atomistic resolution. But to image uh, molecules, uh, they need to be somehow fixed. They has to be dehydrated or, or um, cooled to cryogenic temperatures. So till now, it was not possible to, to image the molecules within their natural movement, which is essential for life. So very recently, me and my uh, colleagues from uh, Chalmers University, from the team of Christoph Langhammer, we introduced uh, a new microscopy method that we call nanofluidic scattering microscopy that uh, breaks the limitation of optical microscopy using the, it uses the visible light to image individual biomolecules freely moving in solution without any labels, basically in conditions that mimic a natural environment. So the essential component is a container of biomolecules, basically a fluidic channel that is made out of glass. Uh, which characteristic dimensions are, of course, bigger than the molecules, but still smaller than the wavelength of the light. And the magic trick that allows us to see otherwise invisible things is that uh, it, um, uh, it takes advantage from the interference of their scattered light from the molecule and the scattered light from the nanochannel. And this way we gain several orders of magnitude uh, in optical contrast of a um, image of a biomolecule. So um, <clears throat> this is, it's my pleasure to show you like first ever recorded uh, video of uh, Brownian motion of a, of a protein that was not modified in a way, in any way, um, just by using uh, visible light. And since then, uh, we of course imaged many different molecules, many different medias, we even captured like the event where two molecules are binding but I believe that we only scratched the surface what the methods can achieve. Um, and I believe that we are just like one step closer to like really diving into this fascinating nanoscopic biological nano universe and observe it in a ways that was not possible today. And, and the Dioscore Center for Single Molecular Optics will be dedicated to do exactly that, to kind of dive um, into this unexplored area and somehow push the boundaries of what is possible to learn from these um, mechanisms of life. So one of the first challenges will be to push the detection limit because seeing better is just better. So we plan to, to detect even uh, molecules that are below, uh, that are in this like sub nanometer uh, regime, which is central for, for many, many uh, biological applications. Uh, seeing is good, but quantitative informations are much more valuable. So, uh, so far the method can uh, very precisely measure molecular weight and hydrodynamic radius. Uh, but uh, we also plan to add there uh, different um, functionalities, 
uh, for instance, the measurement of charge, uh, characteristics, uh, fingerprint, or interaction parameters that together will create, uh, <coughs> it will first of all tell us a lot about the structure and function of the biomolecules and um, also it will provide this um, kind of a multi-parametric uh, tool um, that from which we can learn a lot of information. Uh, the partner of the center is Professor Stefan Dietz uh, from uh, Technical University uh, in Dresden. Uh, he's a leading scientist in uh, cell technology. And together we identified several biological questions related to molecular transport, uh, specifically related to microtubula, which are protein structures uh, inside the cells. And to, to like really understand the molecular transport is not important for prevention and treating the diseases, but also for uh, developing new biotechnology tools that mimicking the nature. So just looking at the, um, at the microtubula, we will have the opportunity to, to get uh, a lot of insights about its dynamics, structure, or function. Uh, also, we will also collaborate with uh, different um, experts from, from the field of uh, molecular uh, biology, such as Pernilla Savskede from uh, Chalmers from Sweden. And she's interested to apply this to, to study complex processes that are associated with the onset of Alzheimer or Parkinson disease. So to summarize, the goals of the Dial Square Center will be to develop a unique experimental tool that will allow us to, to study biological systems uh, in their native state. Um, and with that, address the fundamental biological questions of today and to inspire uh, like new uh, ways for uh, early diagnosis, therapeutic intervention, or novel biotechnologies. Or as would uh, Richard Feynman say, seeing is basically knowing, and when we know how the system operates, we have a tool how to repair it or to prevent uh, its malfunction or to use the same principle to, to innovate. Uh, I remember exactly the day when I saw like the, for the first time the, the molecule uh, in my instrument, and it was the day where uh, um, Event uh, Horizon Telescope actually like launched the, uh, the image of a black hole, which was super exciting for everybody who would like to see things that nobody ever saw before. And, and I remember, and, and at the time I was like looking at this um, short stretched uh, DNA uh, for the first time <coughs> using a principle that basically like a year ago was just an idea that I draw on a, on a whiteboard. And I believe that like there will be a lot of these like amazing moments that are ahead of us when we will kind of explore uh, the, the unexplored uh, biological non-universe. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. I would like to thank all three speakers uh, for sharing their exciting uh, work with us. Uh, and I just have to emphasize that again. This is really um, research in physics and biology at the forefront of science. And uh, they are very likely, the three of them, uh, to break new grounds with their centers. And we should wish them all the best. I really liked your last example, Barbara, because this doesn't really happen often in the life of a scientist that you make a discovery and then this very moment where you see that for the first time, this is such an eye-opening event and that sort of keeps us uh, continuing even uh, when we face limitations. Sometimes experiments don't work out. Maybe as a, a sort of a few concluding recommendations, stay committed to your science uh, because you really want to answer big questions and there will be obstacles. It will be a different story to lead a team or a bigger team, a center compared to being a postdoc and on your own in the lab. 
um, but you can you can rely on on the network and on us. Uh, uh, you have fantastic external uh, collaboration partners. Uh, the, they saw, these are all senior scientists in the fields. They can help you. They can mentor you. Uh, you of course has also the network of all these Dioscuri group leaders. Uh, it's great that so many of the Polish colleagues came here. Uh, maintain a network. They share similar uh, challenges in their careers, despite the fact that they work on different areas. It's great to network and. You you will always meet each other in a couple of years again and so forth, build up that network. And of course, finally, the host institutions are very important for us. And this is a fantastic moment. Everybody is happy celebrating. Uh, the host institution, please commit to these centers. It's really important, especially if there are obstacles. Sometimes the experiments don't work out. Keep uh, uh, supporting them. Uh, be committed to, uh, to the scientists. And yeah, I can conclude with wishing you all the best for all your work. Thanks so much. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, uh, welcome. Uh, the following panel discussion will be about an important topic, about the way of young scientists toward excellence and uh, towards autonomy, and also about the support of home institutions. Uh, my name is Vladimir Peskala and I will moderate this uh, discussion and I believe that it will be uh, inspiring for all of you and it will be full of shared experience and ideas that could be potentially valuable and uh, useful even for uh, free leaders of the new centers. Uh, we have approximately 30 minutes, therefore, unfortunately, there will be no room for uh, the questions from the audience. However, after the discussion, uh, there will be uh, the closing ceremony just behind the rare doors. And after that, there will be uh, plenty of time, time to uh, share the experience, to uh, share uh, ideas for networking and even for uh, other discussions, if you like. Uh, today's speakers are Professor Patrick Kramer, uh, president of the Max Planck Society. Um, so, Professor, please uh, have a seat in front of uh, the audience. <laughs> the next speaker is Professor David uh, Honis, President of the International Affairs Council of the Czech Academy of Sciences. It will, be, it will be Dr. Pavel Tomanchak, Director of Central European Institute of Technology Consortium in Brno. It is also uh, Dr. Uh, Vladimira Petrákova, a group leader at the Jaroslav Heyrovsky Institute of Physical Chemistry of uh, the Czech Academy of Sciences. And the last speaker is Dr. Marketa Kautska, also a group leader at the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Biology. <laughs> Welcome to all of the speakers. Uh, many thanks for joining us. And the very first question goes uh, for Professor uh, Kramer. Uh, in general, I'm just uh, curious, I'm wondering, how does the Max Planck Institute support the uh, young scientists? What do you offer them? And um, yeah, what's the support? Well, thank you for the question. I think today we see examples of how this can be done. But of course, I think what is important is we have to look at the entire career path. Um, and this is quite different for different disciplines. So whatever is true for a molecular biologist may not be true for a physicist or think about somebody who's in law or even in the humanities or so. So we have to look what is the culture of that discipline? What do the young people need in that culture to be successful? But generally what we have to do is to uh, make sure that during the entire career path we have offers. This does not mean, you know, often this is misunderstood. It does not mean that you go in, for example, with your master thesis work, and then you ever stay in the Max Planck Society until you're at the very top. 
This does not mean that you have to be in one organization. It means that you have modules where people can come or they leave to another institution. And that also has to work internationally, right? We just talked about it. And what does that mean? That means we have to have very good programs for PhD students, mm -hmm. doctoral students, our IMPRSs, we have the schools, we have various offers, the graduate centers, and they are often internationally connected. Then the second step is the postdoc. And there, I think we can do much better. This is why we are now coming up with the first postdoc program of the Max Planck Society. So we basically want to make an offer to provide some kind of framework within which you can do your postdoc. And that helps the young people to find their paths. It could be in academia, it could be outside to basically open their eyes during their training phase, you know, look at the world out there and all the opportunities you have for your future. And then the third module is, of course, the PI positions, the group leader positions, the tenure track positions, for example, in our Lisa Meitner program. So these are the three modules and we need transparency between the organizations, but also between countries. And let's be more specific, uh, what, uh, let's, let's name of some of these uh, programs, what would you uh, consider that are the most uh, important, most useful, and you have a, a positive experience with? Yeah, maybe because today we talk about the PI phase when people actually take the responsibility for their own team. There we have different offers. We have what we call the Max Planck Research Group leaders, mm -hmm. and they are funded for six plus three years. So we do now six years because we want to provide more of a perspective so people can have two generations of doctoral students and then three year extension. And uh, we have another program, the Lisa Meitner program. It's especially for female uh, leaders and that is a 10 year track. So it's again six years, but after five years or even earlier, if people perform very, very well. You can be evaluated and then that position is actually turned into a permanent position. And why is that important? It's because we want to keep these young women in the academic system and we want to open a time window uh, which we need until the right position becomes available. That may be a professorship, you know, at the university, it may be within the Max Planck Society, but we need that time window because otherwise you have to be lucky that just at the moment when you're group leader position runs out, there has to be the right position. And that is often in conflict, of course, you know, with um, your family plans, because we're talking about people who are between 30 and 40 years. So everything in life, it's the rush hour of life. Everything comes together, right? Your career development, you found a family, you move house. And so we want to take away a little bit of that stress in order to Pro open this time window that you can have a few more years until the one opportunity arises and then you take the position that you always hope for. Professor Hones, very similar question you know, for you. Now you can compare how does the Czech Academy of Sciences support uh, young uh, scientists? Thank you very much. So the Czech Academy of Sciences also deals with uh, researchers and young researchers of all, at all stages from the PhD students to postdocs and early, car early career researchers. And we have a programs and schemes for supporting, supporting these researchers. Uh, we are definitely involved in, in training of PhD students in collaboration with universities, mainly within the Czech Republic, but also starting to do this, these activities abroad. And uh, so these students are, we, some institutes have a uh, doctoral school, some, some do it on different basis, but the schemes exist. For the postdocs, there is a specific scheme for support of, of postgraduate uh, postdoc researchers that uh, covers uh, usually several tens of people every year. And uh, also for the further steps uh, at, of the really excellent, ex successful early career researchers who wish to establish their own research groups, there is a scheme called Lumina Coherentur that supports uh, the, this formation of these new research research friends and research uh, uh, research groups. But uh, as uh, Professor Kramer said, there are many fields in which we can do better as well. 
it's still far from perfect. For example, I can imagine that this scheme of Lumina Query Room that it's really competitive, but uh, for example, the resources allow a limited number of these of these centers to be to be of the fellowships to be awarded. So this definitely could be increased big time. And also, there is another field that should be, we should pay a little bit more attention than we do now. That's for example the return of people from the, from either studying or doing postdoc abroad, for which the school is a great, great, great instrument, fortunately. And also for the people returning from the maternal paternal leave, for parental leave, sorry, parental leave. So this scheme still needs to be needs to be established and if the schemes uh, is uh, approved so they will be probably part of the new academy for the future program that is being now negotiated yeah, so basically these Thank are you. the main challenges yeah right okay uh dr Tomanchak, you are uh, the director of really successful institute in uh Brno. what's your strategy how to attract uh young people talented people from abroad to go to work to the czech republic okay so i think um what is most important in the context of Czechia is to create uh, opportunities. And that's what we do in Brno kind of sy systematically. Uh, SETA Consortium was established 15 years ago and uh, more than 50% of the people who are there now have not been there uh, when the institute was established. So there is a turnover and it is our institutional strategy to create new research group every once every two years right so so that's of course something which you know is a key ingre in ingredient to develop the scientific uh, environment not only in Brno but also in the country to create the opportunities uh, you know we have to support the people and we have a uh, possibility we of course you know recruit people and offer them a startup package and offer them uh, institutional funding but it, it is not very high and therefore, we are tar targeting specifically people who are able to bring their own funding with them, be it an ERC grant or the Masaryk University offers a matching funds called MESH for the people who are able to bring funding on their own like the ERC. So that can get them going. And of course, the D Dioscuri pr program is one of the very important ingredients for us to be able to attract people to those opportunities which we create. And in fact, we have seen that the involvement of the Max Planck Society really allows us to target and attract people of a very much higher scientific uh, caliber than we usually see in the uh, in interviews for these kind of jobs. But I think very important to say, it's not only about creating the, the job, it's also about creating the conditions for the job and that means the equipment which is offered the space the support for uh, the uh, incoming researcher to re to relocate the support for their f f families for child care the support to to be able to orient in the new environment to 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 write grants and so all these things which uh, scientists kind of live on every day but that alone also is not enough. I think the most important thing I would like to mention at, at the end is that we need to create an environment that, that, where that scientist can thrive. We need to um, create an, an environment where that scientist can interact with other like-minded people that is being challenged uh, scientifically, which is being mentored, you know, helped to develop the science. And this is something which we at SATEC take take very seriously to create a really strong, integrated scientific community where people want to come because they can develop their science, you know, together with, with their colleagues and friends who help them, you know, bring it to, to another level. So I think that if we put all these things together, the opportunities, the funding and the right environment, then we essentially create in Czechia, in Brno, at Masaryk University, at the, at the Charles University at the Academy, something like a Max Planck in Institute, where I actually uh, most of the time work, and this is the vision which we have. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Petrakova, uh, as, a, as a group leader, I have a, I'm, I'm wondering, I have a quite important question. What kind of uh, support are you looking for? And additionally, 
what kind of support do you expect from the home institutions? Okay, thank you very much for the question. So I, I think I'll echo my, uh, you know, the, the speakers before. So uh, I think the biggest challenge for uh, me or for everyone as a group leader is to attract the, you know, the talent, so to get the people. And I mean, doing great science means that you need great people to do it. And being in Prague, you know, it's, it's, it's tough. Yeah, you know, we are not a famous institution and as a, you know, new, new PIs, we're not famous PIs yet, yeah? So we need uh, support of our institution in doing so. Yeah, and we need that support also in you know, teaching us how to do this because it's a big transition you know, from a postdoc to a PI, you know, knowing how to select the best people, but also how to retain them. Yeah, so we need the institution to create supportive environment for our PhD students and for our postdocs. Yeah, we need institutions you know, to um, have fair and transparent conditions for salaries, you know, how we can pay. How, the, how our people can grow, yeah, where we can afford them, yeah, how we can support them. Yeah, so this is the, I think the biggest point is supporting the people and creating an environment where they can flourish, yeah, in a, you know, very transparent, open, and, you know, way, and to be able to share the ideas, yeah, and, you know, bring the, the new ideas but to share it with others and then you know grow together. My second point to this is so this postdoc to PI transition, it's it's a complete new skill set that one needs to have. Yeah. And it's very overwhelming. Yeah. All of a sudden you deal with hiring, with data management plan, you know, and with all these things, and it's only grows. Yeah. It's really important for, for me to have support within this and how to actually implement this on a daily basis. So we have a data management plan, but how do I actually make my postdocs to you know, do it nicely and to do it in a way that you know, makes sense? Yeah, so, so this support I need. And I want to also highlight that my institution also needs a support in this. Yeah, so support from the Academy of Sciences or from the government on how to apply these policies. Yeah, it, these are new things. These are new things for the Czech environment, uh, you know, as well. So even the institutions need support to also provide it then to us. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kowska. You, I saw your uh, raised hand, so let's time for reaction. Yeah, thank you for uh, the opportunity to speak. That's an excellent point, and also uh, this attracting uh, new people, good people. We should definitely increase the diversity, especially in Czech Republic because the percentage of the foreigners is still rather low. And of course, if you want to attract good people, they are also abroad, but they will not want to go to a conservative country when they will know that they will have to deal with bureaucracy, uh, people not being willing to communicate in English and so on. Mm -hmm. And to all these points, what the young PI really needs is to not have to deal with an overwhelming uh, bureaucracy, which again, here could be a little bit better. <laughs> um, because that takes really a lot of time, which you could otherwise uh, invest into the research. Oh. Then, um, of course, um, excellent research infrastructure is great. And if, if maybe the, the facilities are not directly at the institute, then at least communicate and allow the researchers to access facilities at other institutes. I think most important is also research freedom and having an environment which tolerates failure, because then it allows the researchers to invest in, into high risk, high gain uh, research projects. And that's what powers the, the science to go forward and be really innovative. And probably it's always good to have a competitive conditions to attract good people compared to the abroad and uncomplicated political landscape. So that means that um, the different levels at the institutes, um, top leadership, um, research group, group leaders, but also uh, staff scientists and uh, students that they will be able to communicate the needs and, and try to achieve um, situation and conditions that will benefit them all. This would be the main point. Dr. Kotska, uh, you have a lot of experience from uh, Czechs, Swedish, Austrian, or even German scientific institutions. So you can easily compare. So um, what type of support you find the most useful to make the start of young scientists smooth? 
will support. Uh, well, it's always good to have um, optimized onboarding for the people. So when I come to the new country, try to start a new life, try to learn the culture, but also the rules, um, I really need help. It's not like that I can, I come and I know instantly what to do. So if the institution will, uh, will have optimized onboarding procedures, it will significantly speed up the start of the actual science. Uh, then for many um, uh, people which are in this age, 30 to 40 years, they bring families and it would be great if the institute has equipment and facilities that will help to accommodate, to care for the children. And um, otherwise, basically what we mentioned before that we need that still stays to this point. So even the support for family members, right? Absolutely. There should be, for example, dual career, which exists in Germany. I'm in fact not sure if it exists here, but it's enormously helpful. It mm -hmm. makes the transfer of the whole families and the partners much easier. Uh, Mr. Hones and Mr. Uh, Tomanchak, can institutions in Czech Republic provide uh, the support of, on that level uh, that we heard just? Well, I think that absolutely can. The question uh -huh. is whether they do, right? Um, um, <laughs> I would say that that will probably a little bit depend on the institution and I think, you know, I will maybe repeat myself, but it's not all about money. It's also about culture, right? So I think, for example, you know, one point which uh, Marketa brought up is, is very important is that the young researchers, they also need to be protected a little bit, you know, from the relentless uh, pressure to perform and to publish and to create outputs because when you are starting your research what you need is time you need to have the environment where you are allowed to try to do what you came to do which is probably something very ambitious and very unlikely to actually work right and if you are constantly being challenged you know by you know publish or perish you know five papers a year or something like this some ridiculous number which is in certain fields unachievable because a typical project takes six years right then you are really in an environment which is not supportive right mm -hmm. and so i think if we have uh, institutions which can actually provide a little bit of a safe haven for the people who are coming with big ambitious ideas and give them the time to make them happen you know then uh, we will become an attractive ca country to start and, uh, and, and, and continue scientific careers. So once again, it's all, all about money. <laughs> Professor Hones, uh, what's your reaction? What's your point? Uh, of course, it's not all about money. It's about the, the attitude as well. And uh, so uh, there are definitely many activities and many ways how the academy and also the institutes can help and building these two new diaspora centers at the Institute of Physics is a great example for that because they provide an infrastructure and so on. But also there is one more thing or activity that deserves to be, to be mentioned and it's the Our Access Center that is administered by our infrastructure that really helps people, foreigners coming to our country with the go going through all the administrative hurdles that are really can be really difficult and discouraging, as we all know. And the, the, their, I think their work will help with helping these people obtaining visa and accommodating within the Czech Republic is very helpful, I would say. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Th thank you very much. Uh, Professor Kramer, questions again for, again, uh, for you. Uh, what support do you offer to family members in the Max Planck Institute? Yeah, I mean, can I maybe before I answer that, mm -hmm. um, say something along the lines that Pavel Tomanchak already mentioned. You know, we will not be able to pay the salaries that Google pays, mm -hmm. full stop. We're in the public sector, so we, but we need to be attractive for the best. So how do we do that? It's by offering something in addition to the salary, right? And for that, we need to build a reputation so that people actually know how it is to come <laughs> to a center and to work there. And how do you build that reputation? Well, it's because you take in the young people and you provide very good conditions. And you know, when I say conditions, I not only talk about the conditions to do the science, it's also this cultural environment. Do you have shared seminars? You know, um, will your question be taken seriously when you're a young person? Um, are you encouraged to contribute? Are you probably even encouraged to invite the speaker? Are you taken seriously from the day one? You know, also you're in a training phase. This kind of element, you know, less hierarchy, more uh, collegiality. 
and also the um, you know interconnection with other institutions to broaden their perspective to offer mentoring to offer all kinds of advice career advice um, but also not to overburden the people to offer them this environment where they can grow where they also can discuss openly in a group seminar for example their results and also doubt their own progress or doubt their own results where it's possible to talk about things openly and make people grow. And this is actually what they will tell, you know, the students back home at the university when they will be asked, how was it like? How was your experience at the Institute when you did your PhD there? And then you built your reputation. Um, you can see that with our IMPRSs, the international research schools, the first years are tough. And then after a few years, you know, second, third generation, suddenly you get hundreds of applications. The quality of the applications becomes very good and people are very happy. And this information is nowadays spread very easily because people are on social media. They're all interconnected. And so you can build that reputation, but you also have to do your homework and provide this kind of environment. And that goes well beyond the funding, the salary, the equipment. It's all these other things that people need to become a really strong scientist. Now, maybe the specific question that you had, that depends, of course, a little on the country. Um, we had at our institute at Göttingen, where I spent the last 10 years, we had a great situation because the childcare facility was on campus. So, you know, both parents could work and often both are scientists. And they would just go over the road when they get a phone call that there's some issue with the child. They feel much safer, you know, when you're separated over a long distance or when you even struggle to get childcare in the first place or when it's not affordable. Then you're also discouraged to found a family because you think, right, how, if I have family, so how do I deal with it? How do I get everything managed? So those are the kind of offers we need so that people can combine family life with, with their work and there's still a long way to go because not all the campuses offer this and it's also different depending on the even within Germany for example I don't know if you have that here there's great differences between the individual states and the individual sites uh, gradients within Germany you know where it works better and less less good thank you very much uh, the question for Maybe both of you, uh, Dr. Petráko and Dr. Kautska, uh, what are the biggest challenges uh, that you can see in the career of young scientists? And can you also see some progress to make it easier, make it uh, smooth, make it uh, better? So I can start with the challenges, at least like um, for a scientist in Germany, and that's to find a permanent position. Uh -huh. Because especially German law defines a period of time when you can be employed on a, a time-limited contract, and that's 12 years. And if you do not get permanent position within the 12 years, um, you are out of academia, which is, of course, something which um, you worked for hard the whole life. And um, that's kind of the scary thing in the future, which <laughs> one has to address. Um, in this respect, it would help if uh, the young PIs would be more visible and they would be more promoted, or maybe there would be schemes for networking and making, um, um, saying, let's say, uh, Max Planck Society has this wonderful cohort of um, really smart research personalities. We offer them to the universities and institutes abroad. They achieve this and that. And um, so this kind of support, finding the future. Yeah, I think I will again echo this. So uh, in, in Czechia, it's even more difficult because there is an absence of tenured positions. So we don't really have a you know tenured position that we could actually aspire for. Yeah, so there are, or, or it, it's not, you know, it, it, when they are, it's, it's very like fragmented and it's not a like general scheme. So when we get this uh, starting package, it's, a, it's, it's, it's excellent, it's a great win, but then we don't really, you know, it's not very defined what it is to, um, to like what you should do to uh, succeed. Yeah, what it is, this success, yeah? Uh, is it that you publish this many papers in this many journals or that you teach a lot or that you mentor students or that you served, um, you know, serve the society? Yeah, it, it's not very well defined, so we don't really hand in our tenure 
package, you know, then somewhere to then have the tenure. And this is very, very frustrating, yeah, because, I mean, we, we, we know what we signed up for, yeah, we know the frustration of science, yeah, but not having this light at the end of the tunnel, yeah, something to aspire for, yeah, some tenure, this is very challenging. On the other hand, yeah, this also gives freedom, yeah, so when the conditions are not strictly defined, we can, you know, you know, do as we feel like. Yeah? So when we have a strong feeling of, you know, this is what I want to achieve, the system lets us. And then it's up to us to, you know, defend it and to say, you know, I've succeeded in this and that. So, you know, there is, uh, you know, two ways in this, but still this absence of tenured positions and, you know, this, you know, clear path of like knowing where you're going is, 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 is a tough thing and it needs to change. Thank you very much. Thank you to all of the speakers. Unfortunately, the time is over, so we have to stop. So once again, thank you very much. And uh, uh, for now, please accept the invitation uh, for the closing ceremony just behind the uh, rare door. Thank you very much.